Hi, I'm Gavin Sine. And I'm Vivian Corrigan, and welcome to Perthshire Online TV. So how have you been this week? I've been very good. I haven't been too bad at all. I've been busy. We've had lots of interviews. We've done some locational work as well. And um, we've been uh, doing some interviews with quite a number of businesses, actually, over the past week or so. So um, filming for both their, um, both for the show and for some of their own um, websites and things as well. So it's, been, so it's been very busy, very industrious in Perth. How about you? Yeah, I've been the same. I've been out and about chatting to this one and that one. So, yeah, you'll just have to wait and see. So, as they say, it's on with this week's show. And welcome to this week's Perthshire Online TV News Round. It's great to see the local property market bouncing back. Local house builder A&J Stevens have released seven new properties for sale at their established development in Schoon by Perth. In response to local demand, the detached three and four bedroom bungalows and villas are now available for advanced reservation at Perth-based Stevens Bulgarvi development. The development of over 250 two to five bedroom family homes has proved to be a winner with buyers over recent years due to the consistently high quality finish of its homes, together with its prime location. The company recently unveiled a new show home at Bulgarvi's sister development, Bulgarvi Mill, which features its brand new design specification, a refreshing contemporary approach which acknowledges the changing demands of the company's clients. Although the newly released seven properties reflect Stephen's more traditional style, design cues from the show home will be evident in the kitchen and bathroom layout and specification. For more information, go to stephen.co.uk. Remember the Perth and Kinross Business Week. It's an exciting new initiative being coordinated by the Perth and Kinross Council Business Growth Team. And this will be the first time there's been a Business Week in Perth and Kinross, and certainly the first time for the new city of Perth. The Business Week runs over the 11th to the 15th of June, and you can register by going to perthandkinrossbusinessweek.co.uk. Slow Food Perth events are always popular, and they have a dinner at Opus One restaurant on Tuesday the 1st of May at 7pm. If you haven't already booked, there's still time to do so. And Opus One recently appointed a new head chef, Rory Lovey. Rory was top student at Perth College, where he received the Tom Kitchen Perpetual Challenge Award, and Rory reached the semi-finals of Young Chef Culinary Excellence UK last year. Perth Autism Support officially launched on the 23rd of April. The charity, founded in November 2011, supports children under 16 diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder and their families throughout Perth and Kinross through a number of services. And the 61st summer season has been launched at Pitlochry Festival Theatre. The season opens on Friday the 18th of May with the smash hit sci-fi musical comedy Little Shop of Horrors. Already proving a big hit at the box office with interest from audiences far and wide, this ludic ludicrously funny, toe-tapping send-up of 1950s creature feature movies will launch the season with a bang. Hot on its heels, PFT is thrilled to be staging the Scottish premiere of Patrick Barlow's Olivier Award-winning version of The 39 Steps, and this opens on May the 24th. Still playing to packed houses in London's West End, this hilarious adaption of the classic Hitchcock spy movie is nothing if not ingenious and inventive, perhaps even a little mad. After all, the versatile and highly energetic cast of four play 139 roles between them. And some advance warning. Canal Street multi-storey car park in Perth will be closed from 6am on Sunday the 27th of May until 1pm on Monday the 28th of May in order to carry out resurfacing works to the entrance and exit areas. The facility will be entirely closed to vehicles between these dates. The resurfacing work will continue at level 2 over Monday and Tuesday the 29th of May. However, access to the upper levels will be maintained. During the 27th to the 28th of May, multi-storey permit holders can use any other council-operated car park. Resurfacing at Canal Street is near the final phase of a well-progressed general maintenance improvement programme, which will be completed shortly with the installation of a new weigh-in sign at the rear of the building to better facilitate entry to upper floors. Meanwhile, major resurfacing works at Thimble Row Car Park are on course for completion ahead of schedule by the 1st of June. And remember to register for the Perth Kilt Run on the 2nd of June. The Perth Kilt Run Scotland is a world record-breaking attempt to set a new record for the world's largest kilt race. You can register online at perthkiltrun.co.uk. And on the subject of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee celebrations, a special spawn has been handmade by Scottish Spawns for presentation to the Piper or Pipe Band who will travel furthest to take part in the 1000 Pipers Parade on the 2nd of June. 
So, it's all things Scottish in Perth on the 2nd of June. Make sure you look at your kilts for the day. Fairways provide cost-effective HR support from contracts to recruitment, health and safety to training. Fairways, working with you, for you. Visit fairways-uk.com or call Perth 632 561 for a free consultation. I did it Fairways. Now, one of the biggest theatrical events happening in Perth this year is the Perth Drama Group's production of their next shows, which is Family Jewels and Weighing of the Heart. Let's give you the full details of those. Now, the Perth Drama Club presents Family Jewels, which is a kind of a spoof, kind of, it's like kind of a whodunit when the Family Jewels go missing. And the Weighing of the Heart is effectively two plays with the same characters. One's about finding love and one's about losing weight, whichever order you Want to do that now it's going to be held at the north inch community campus from the 2nd the 3rd and the 4th of may for tickets and information please go to their website and it's www.perthdramaclub.co.uk i'll say that one more time www.perthdramaclub.co.uk Dot co dot uk. Now we went along to the rehearsals to find out what it was all about and what the club's about. Now the good thing about Perth Drama Group, it's they don't have to stick to plays that are already out there in the uh, ether as it was. They've even got their own in-house playwrights as well and I've got one of them here with me, uh, John White, who's uh, written the next play. It's one of the next plays that have been performed. Can you just tell me a little bit about them? Well, they started off as two plays, Alan. Mm -hmm. um, they were both sort of separate entities. Uh, but your good self and I discussed them. We did. And you thought that perhaps they would work together as one. Mm -hmm. And we took some of the characters from each play and inter you know, put them, interlinked them so mm -hmm. that we can see their, their journey through, through the Pounds Away and then into Lonely Hearts. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's two plays effectively brought together with the same characters, but each play has effectively got a different kind of feel to it. So what's the first they're one? They're both different stories. The first one is called Pounds Away and is set in a... Uh, so a rather failing weight loss clinic. Or now, is, this one of the, is this one of the pluses of actually having the playwright in the group because you're writing for the rather rotund gentlemen that are in the uh, group? I'm glad you said that. <laughs> I'm only not myself. <laughs> I, must I admit, say that. One of the temptations is when you... I, I enjoy writing plays as, yeah, a, as a hobby. Yeah, yeah. And when you're a member of a club like this, you do tend to sometimes think, well, age-wise, mm -hmm. size-wise, yeah. if you want all the different characteristics so that you can write... And, and it doesn't mean you're casting ahead of the game, mm -hmm. but you, you've got an idea of who's available and the kind of people that we've got. And we don't want to be sexist because there are rotund ladies in it as well. I'm glad you said that <laughs> as well, too! <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> so one's about love and one's about losing weight. One's about losing weight, um, but the characters who are in that then spill over into what I call episode two, which yeah. is, starts off in a park. And it came from the idea of once just lifting up a local newspaper and looking at the Lonely Hearts column, mm -hmm. which as well as being a mixture of pathos, but also quite amusing, mm -hmm. Um, I used that idea to start creating this thought of some of the characters and some new characters through the park. We meet, we meet them gradually in the park mm -hmm. and um, we see that they're all looking for love. Mm -hmm. And then that moves on into a, a speed dating site um, um, where these characters again meet up and at the very end we go back to the park and we find out then if there has been any love matches. Oh, well, I'm sure there might have been one or two, but we'll have to wait and see. Well, we've tried to work out if I was to write the, 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 the next episode, who would still be in love uh, <laughs> oh, okay. in another episode. After the weight loss one. <laughs> now, you've been a playwright as well for a long time. What's your history of drama and drama? Well, I, I started at college. Um, it's a long story. I was meant to be going to specialise in PE, sport. Mm -hmm. But when I turned my head to the left, I saw people go into the drama studio and just something clicked and I said, I'm going to try something mm -hmm. different. So off I toddled, which was my friend's mm -hmm. amusement, and um, started drama, did drama at college, and then have been a member of different drama societies up in Aberdeenshire, Ailith, and then I was given a chance to direct at Ailith. 
um, when the director retired after many years, and I'd been one of these people that said, I wouldn't do it like that. I'll do it. And so they said, right, let's see you, Trevor, go. So I've worked there, and I've directed in Dundee, Thompson Lane, and I've directed uh, Tayside Opera. Yeah. And then decided that that was the world of musicals, yeah. but it would be nice to give the world of drama okay. a shot. And my partner Ruth and I joined the club about a year ago. And that's the good thing about the club, though, uh, coming to that. Perth Drama Group, it's not just about turning up and doing a bit of acting in an amateur way, it's got a professional attitude it's, to it. Well, my attitude, and I'm sure most of the members here have always been, we're here to have fun, yeah. um, but we're also here to learn, and we're also here to work together and try, if we're going to put something on the stage like we are next month, that it's going to be as professionally done as possible. As possible. Yes, and it's actually come across because we've seen some of the rehearsals. Well, we work, we work, John, the other director, myself, work everybody hard, <laughs> but everybody's keen to work hard. There's no moans about how hard they work. Yeah. Um, and so everybody comes and they do their bit, and we very often there's new ideas, different mm -hmm. ideas from the company, and so it's, it's very okay. much a group well, effort. Well, listen, listen, if you've got, uh, if you fancy joining the Perth Drama Group, all you've got to do is get in touch. And it's not just about acting on stage and making a fool of yourself, you think like Gabby might have wanted to do earlier on. <laughs> it's about you can come, you can write plays, you can direct, you can do backstage, you can help with props, there's also the, the wardrobe, etc. So it's, it encompasses lots of you different, different genres. You can learn anybody's welcome because we need all those people. It's not just about the actors, it's about, as you say, the backstage, yeah. front of house, making things, um, all the facets of the theatre. Yeah. yeah, so when you quite often, I've been in a play, you hear the director going, it's not just about the talent, dear, move on. <laughs> <laughs> so come and see it. Perth Drama Club, I'm here at the Perth Drama Club with one of its, shall we say, active members. Not that they're not all active, but there are some that are more active than others, and this is one of the very active ones, which is another way of saying Gobby. He's also called Barry as well, and this is Barry Tweed. Hi, Barry. Hi, Barry. Are you all right? <laughs> like talking to yourself, isn't <laughs> it? It is a little bit, yeah. <laughs> How long have you been involved with the Perth Drama Club? Uh, about two years now. Okay. All together, yeah. Now, you're one of those, as I said, oh, Gobby's a bit of the wrong thing to say, but you're, you're quite an activist when it comes to getting the word out there around Perth about the Drama Club. What, what's the passion behind that? Right, well, uh, we formed a, a PR committee or a, a PR team, the, the three of us, and uh, it was a way of trying to um, bring the club uh, more into the, the public eye um, through different methods, um, posters and using local media press, um, uh, local online television uh, and local radio stations, uh, all in an effort to, to get the name out there, get the brand out there. Um, part of that as well was to um, arrange the club's first ever uh, website, which has been uh, very, very uh, successful. And um, all of that has led to the highest number of members we've had uh, in the club, as far as I uh, know, um, for a, a long time. So it, it's, it's, um, it's been great fun, it really has. I mean, Barry's got quite a reputation around Perth, well, I should qualify that, yes, he has got quite a reputation around Perth, but a reputation for being quite tenacious when it comes to whatever he gets involved in. You're very tenacious with this. I mean, you don't really take no for an answer, do you? Because I've been on the receiving end of the, can we just, can we just, no, no, come on, I don't really want, but all right, I'll do it then, go on. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I suppose that comes from a background in, in sales and, and marketing. I mean, um, I was always taught, once you get hold of something, I'm like a dog with a bone, you know, and, and uh, it, it's difficult to, to difficult to uh, uh, say no to me in a very charming and, and uh, polite sort of way, of course. Um, but um, when people say, "Oh, I'll get back to you," or "I'll, I'll do this," or "Do that," if they don't, then I'm, I'm straight back in there. And uh, uh, sometimes he who shouts the loudest uh, is first in the queue. That's true. In in a very nice sort of way. You know? Did you have much of a history with amateur dramatics in the past? No, um, like a lot of people I've spoken to uh, in this club, uh, I hadn't actually done any acting since I was at school. Um, it was something I always wanted to do, and uh, now that uh, I've reached the uh, sort of uh, later years, um, it's oh, late, of, late 40s. Late, late 40s, yeah. of course, yeah. It's one of the things on my to do list that, that had to be ticked off, and uh, uh, I was with the radio station Perth FM mm -hmm. when the drama club at that time sent an email saying that they're looking for more mm -hmm. male members. Would we put mm -hmm. that out on the radio? Which we did, and I thought, right, this is it, this is my chance, so the rest is history. So, how much drama? 
drama goes on in the drama club? <laughs> a lot. <laughs> a lot, yeah. Um, everybody in the club is very passionate about what they do. Um, and uh, we have uh, lots of interesting debates. There's lots of uh, uh, characters in the club, lots of colourful characters. Uh, but at the end of the day, we get to where we want to get. Um, and it's, it's all part of the fun. Well, you've got to have different dynamics between all of you, otherwise you'd never produce anything that was worthwhile watching. Well, absolutely, yeah, yeah. And, and the enthusiasm in the club is, is absolutely fantastic. Um, not only from those actually uh, on the stage and acting, but uh, the backstage, the front of house, it, it's a great team effort. You know, everybody um, uh, lends a hand, whether it's cleaning the, the club rooms um, or uh, organising raffles, fundraising events. Um, I mean, it's great to see now, and I think we've got a, a, a fabulous team here, really, have, of all ages as well. Now, tell me about the upcoming productions. What's your involvement? Right, OK. Um, we've got two plays on uh, May the 2nd, 3rd and 4th, the North Inch Community Campus Theatre. Uh, the first one uh, on stage will be Family Jewels. Um, I'm not uh, directly involved in that, um, but uh, it's a, a spoof, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a comedy spoof, um, directed by uh, John Johnson and written by Carolyn McColl, uh, who uh, wrote the very successful uh, play that we had that uh, we, we got to the second round of the, the regional finals uh, last year, which was uh, You Don't Know Me. The second yes, play... Sorry? Well, yes, you like. <laughs> <laughs> the, the second play, um, which uh, I, I have a part in, uh, is uh, called uh, Weighing of the Heart. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, again, it's a comedy. It's a mixture of um, a, a situation in uh, a weight loss club, slimming club, uh, which then develops into a dating club. Those characters move on from the dating club and go into the... Uh, f go from the, the, the slimming club into the dating club later on. So uh, lots of laughs uh, guaranteed yeah. for, for everybody. Um, okay. And that was written by uh, John White and uh, directed by John as well. OK, brilliant. So just give us those dates again. That's May the 2nd, 3rd and 4th at the North Inch Community Campus Theatre. Try saying that after a couple of sherries. But <laughs> North Inch Community Campus Theatre uh, in Perth. And uh, the curtains go up at 7.15. OK, Barry, thanks very much for taking the time to talk to us. And you make sure that you go along and support the Perth Drama Club. Yes, after that's done, I must show you the diamond necklace she left. Indeed, you must. Where is the one I'm over? I'm right here. I haven't missed the will reading, have we? <laughs> <laughs> not yet, not yet, my line. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, Cassandra, there's not been anybody here to read it. <laughs> oh, don't. Actually, Jeremy, I ride my car. I prefer to keep my broomstick the, for occasions worthier than this. <laughs> Hello, Alfred. Good evening, Diana Nixon. It's a pleasure to see you again. Hello, Auntie Eva. Greetings, child. I haven't missed the main events, have I? Of course not. We didn't want to... Uh, we didn't want to... Help introduce... Introduce more disappointment to your life. Oh, that's much appreciated. After all, I wouldn't want to end up like you. <laughs> I'm delighted today to be joined in the studio by Angie Ferguson and Angie is the project manager for Perth Autism Support Group. Angie, welcome to Perth Online Thank TV. You. So, autism as a condition, can you give us a little bit of a background and understanding to some of the viewers that maybe don't appreciate what, what, an, what autism and autistic condition is? is and what some of the symptoms are typically. Certainly. Um, autism is a lifelong developmental disorder. Um, there are no physical um, attributes that go along with autism and it very much centres around um, problems with the individual in terms of social and communication issues. 
Right, so when you say spectrum, does that mean that, that realistically there's, there's no two children perhaps that have much the same thing? There may be some commonality, but it could be different in a different individual. That's exactly right. There's three main areas um, of difficulty that an individual with autism will have in their life. Um, however, they will um, affect each individual in a different way. Right. And tell me, age group-wise, how, how does that work? What, what, what kind of age group did, would you typically see a child or understand a child to be autistic? Is it from a very early age or is it, does it tend to be when they're nearing 10 years old or, or, or what, what kind of age groups are there? The diagnosis age um, is dropping um, and has dropped quite considerably just even in the last few years. Um, so we have got, within Perth Autism Support, we have got some children of age 2 and 3 who yeah. have been diagnosed, who have registered with us. So, Perth Autism Support Group, <coughs> as, as an, as an organisation, what was the what was the instigation and the background to, to setting that up? Um, it was a little bit of professional and personal background um, for both myself and my colleague Nicola. Um, there are no autism specific services in Perth and Canross um, at the moment. There's pockets of services who will provide um, for children on the spectrum, but nothing that's specific to them and takes solely into account the difficulties that a child on the spectrum will find um, accessing social activities. And how, how long has the group been set up for and what, what type of services do you actually provide? Because I assume it's for, it's for the children and probably their family as well to some extent. That's right. We look at the family as a whole. Although our services are geared towards children under the age of 16 who have been diagnosed with autism, we're very conscious that that impacts on the entire family unit. So we will do support work and awareness sessions for parents, grandparents and siblings who are quite important um, to, to help them understand their own feelings around their brothers or sisters. Diagnosis. And it must be, you know, these days when you look at the typical career and work environment, you know, the mum and the dad are, are out working all the time, or, or maybe working on full or part time basis, and the grandparents actually tend to look after children quite a lot. I mean, that, there must be quite an education curve for them and an awareness for them as well. Absolutely. Um, we find that a lot of these children cannot access um, after school club, mainstream after school clubs or breakfast clubs. So a lot of the childcare um, is landing with the grandparents if the parents both work. Um, grandparents then traditionally have to get their head around not only looking after grandchildren when they've brought up their own family but to do it with a child with additional support needs and perhaps social and communication issues that they have to then change possibly the way they brought up their own children. And the group also as well as you providing sort of education and awareness for the for the family then the, is there other specific events for the um, for the children themselves as well? Yes we do alongside our, our programme of awareness raising we do um, intervention therapies for the children on the spectrum so um, at the moment we've done music therapy and yoga therapy and we're looking to expand that side of services um, and we also do social activities just that we kind of think about what the ch child needs um, in terms of environment what's right for them timing so perhaps places aren't as busy as they would be um, to get them along and to, to meet each other and to try and build relationships with each other and we also involve the families in that as well. So again, the siblings can get their peer support and the parents get a chance to meet up with each other as well. So, you know, how, how big is the support group at this point in time from the, from the, the children family perspective and, the, and obviously there's a lot of organisation involved needed in mm -hmm. it as well. Absolutely, yeah. Um, we have, since January, we've registered um, 40 families with us for services. Um, so people dip in and out. They, they use um, the services that they require or that they, they feel their children might need. Um, we've just recently run a siblings awareness course, for example, that had nine brothers and sisters who came along. Um, but obviously that's not right for everyone because they may not have you know more than one child um, so yes we kind of look at, at, at the family as a whole and try and get as many of them sort and of involved. Got, and so you've got 45 families at this point yes, in time 40, yeah. and is that how is that representative do you think within this uh, Perthshire area is that is that would you say that's a norm average or, or what's the kind of statistics around it at the moment? The statistics with autism are are quite unknown and quite difficult to sort of define. Um, the the current statistic that they, they think of children on the spectrum is one in every eighty eight. So if you apply that to the school role of Perth and Canross, um, there is the possibility um, of one hundred and eighty six children being somewhere on the spectrum within our current education services. And you'll work quite closely with education services 
services um, in person can rule outside with sim. Absolutely. We, we rely very heavily on the support from Education and Children's Services and also from NHST side um, and the ASD assessment team. Um, and they have so far been incredibly supportive and helpful in identifying gaps um, that they may see as, as issues that they've come across mm -hmm. with parents. Um, so they've definitely helped to shape our services so far. And there's you and Nicola. Yep. But volunteers needed as well? Absolutely. So yeah, anybody out there who would like to come along and help, um, we're more than welcome to, to um, speak to and see if there's somewhere that they can help within the organisation. We have tried so far to use um, students where they can get practical experience, for example, through the Easter holidays we ran sports coaching sessions. Um, we got sports development students from um, Perth College to come down and assist our experienced coaches, so it gave them an insight in working with um, children with additional support needs as well but we have a lot of events going on that don't need any specific um, experience or interest and we're more than happy and more than welcome to, to speak Delighted to, to hear so a little bit of a call to action at this point in time then um, Angie, well, how, how do they get in touch with you? There's a number of ways that people can get in touch with us, we have our Facebook page um, which is facebook.com forward slash Perth Autism Support we have our Twitter account um, which is Perth Autism and our website which is um, perthautismsupport.org.uk and obviously people can contact us at Inveramond Business Centre. Um, our telephone number is Perth 646759. Well, Angie, all the best moving forward and um, please pop back into the studio and give us an update in a few months' time. Thank you very much. I know from my work as an MSP over many years there is a huge need for services in Perth and Cross for uh, families with an autistic child. I think what's being uh, announced today is absolutely tremendous. There are many families across the area who will benefit from the services on offer. It's all about raising awareness, it's all about helping them feel uh, part of something much bigger and, and avoid all the loneliness that comes with autism. I'm Annabelle Ewing, the SNP MSP from Mid Scotland in Fife, and I'm delighted to be here today in Perth to uh, celebrate the official launch of Perth Autism uh, Support with the project manager Angie and her co worker Nicola. They have done an enormous uh, job in getting to the stage of the official launch today, and Perth Autism Support. Uh, will play a significant role in providing uh, information and awareness, in providing support, in, in providing training, uh, and to fill a gap where children under 16 with uh, autism spectrum disorder and their families can find uh, a, a place that they can come and they can exchange information and, and obtain support. I think it's an excellent initiative and I'm delighted to be here today to celebrate the official launch of Perth Autism Support. The majority of victims of domestic abuse are women with children. And joining me is Karina Robertson, senior social worker with Bernardo's, who is coming to talk to us about this. Hello, Karina. Lovely Hello. to have you. Now, how does domestic abuse affect children? In a variety of ways. Um, there's been lots of research over the last 10 years, and the old um, myth that families stay together regardless um, kind of isn't now bore out. Right. We know that um, children who live in homes where there's domestic abuse, they tend not to do well at school. They tend not to um, thrive with other children. Um, even playtime, children won't bring friends home. You know, they're frightened to bring children yeah. home because of the impact that their parents' behaviour will have. Um, educationally, they struggle. Um, sometimes they're, they're missed because they're quite quiet in, within the classroom and you know, um, it's the quiet child, so they're fine, they're just getting on with it, when in actual fact they're just keeping their heads down and keeping out the way. Um, Health-wise, as children get older, sometimes they try and in intervene in, in their parents' fighting, um, so that can have yeah. mortality um, effects on, on children. Yeah, it's really, it's, it's quite shocking really, isn't it? And also these problems go on right through life as well, can't they? Yes. You know, it's not just the immediate effects there and then at the time. Now you work closely with the police, don't you? Tell us a little bit about that. We're based in police stations, in police offices, and we sit in the same office as the police domestic abuse police officers. Very long words. Uh -huh. um, so what would happen is ordinarily, for example, last night if there were any incidents of domestic abuse, um, my colleague would look at them this morning and then she may refer on to myself right. or other partner agencies. But generally our work initially would be the crisis intervention 
that would be um, looking at how we're going to help and support and keep that family safe now. And that primarily is, is to look at the primarily women and their, and their children. And that may be that they need to go into refuge. It may be that we need to safety plan for today. Um, it may be that we need to move them out of the area. Yeah. Now, some women might have fear, though, if you get involved, could they lose their children? Absolutely. I'm sure that's not the case. No, and, and that is one of the reasons women won't leave, mm -hmm. is because the perpetrator will say, um, you, you'll lose your children. You know, Alpha and social work, it's because you're a bad parent that this is happening. And the other thing I think um, our families believe is that they then lose control of the situation. Right, but that's not the case Absolutely when you get involved. Absolutely not. No, we will work with families prior to them even making a complaint. They right. don't actually have to have made a complaint to work with us. And that's also the police domestic abuse officer as well. We're here really to support them to make a decision, an informed decision on what's right for them. And it isn't always the case that families will benefit from reporting the crime. We actively encourage it because it's a preventative tool. Yes. Um, however, we wouldn't necessarily, um, you know, if, they, if the family don't want to report, then then that's fine with us. We'll still support You're still them. Still there, yes. absolutely, and for as long as as is required. We we tend to work short term. Mm -hmm. We would then pass on to our partner agencies, who would hopefully get involved, and that handover process would be quite smooth. Right. So families don't feel left and then picked up again by another agency. So, I'd say a typical example. I, I know there's probably not typical examples because every situation is completely different. Mm -hmm. But just say, give us an example of the kind of support and help that Bernardos offer. Um, recently we've had um, an, a, a lady very badly assaulted by her husband and with that lady from the initial contact um, we moved her out of the area for a short period of time um, and during that period we were supporting her to link in with her community so it would be helping to find schools for the children, GPs for the children, ensuring that she had everything in her accommodation. Uh, that went on for two or three months and then she's come back to the area and so we've done all that linking, but we've also supported her through the court process as well, her and the children. They've right. all had to give evidence. So that's on a, a practical level, but on an emotional level, I'm sure you offer support as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. With that family, primarily I was working with the children because they were really, really struggling. Right. And it was just to give them space to talk about what happened to them from their perspective. Mm -hmm. Because children are very good at trying to protect the grown-ups. Yeah. You know, the mum, they're trying to make sure she's okay and doesn't want the mum to see them upset. Or and One of the children was getting quite angry and feeling absolutely responsible. It was all his fault yeah, that this do, had do happened. Yeah, children feel that it's the, it can be their fault? Absolutely, mm -hmm. yes. They... they internalize everything it's it's their fault and it may be that they didn't eat their tea last night and that's why dad yeah. lost his temper or um it's a friday night and you know we know that dad comes in has a bath and then goes out drinking and um he you know maybe he was a bit grumpy or he, he kind of said an odd word to his dad so yeah. yeah children always majority of the time take responsibility they feel it's their fault and the other part is with reconstituted families if if it's not their biological father Yes. Then that then puts an awful lot more pressure yeah. on on the children, um, and also sibling rivalry. And we do have instances where particularly boys feel that they need to be quite dominant with their female siblings because mm -hmm. that's the role that that they're used to. That's their role model, that's and that's what, what you do. Seen, yeah, yeah. So it is. It's really really tough for children. So we do offer them just space to just unload what's going on with them and. We do that in a variety of ways. We use mediums like um, camcorders or walking. Or it, it actually isn't, you know, it doesn't. It's not a big difficult thing to do or no, to I was plan going to say, for you to deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis. I mean, you're very smiley and you clearly love your job. Mm -hmm. um, how do you cope with it? You know, cause it, do you find it easy or, or hard? Or? It, it is difficult, and it's and it's a really it's it's not a good subject matter when most people say what do you do for a living. You know, it, it's a kind of conversation killer. However, the the best part for for us as workers is we see the healed family. You know, we see families move on, and it may take years. And we may be working with families off and on for well. You know, I've just recently come back in contact with a girl who's now 17, and I worked with her when she was 12. And I really enjoyed meeting up with her again. And I asked her what was really good about, you know, when we spent our time together. And she said, Tuesday after school, I used to come to your office and I could just be safe and talk about my things. 
Yeah. Not school, not my friends, not my mum, not my dad, my things. Yeah, and she, what she could say to you was in confidence. Maybe she would say things to you that they wouldn't say to their, their mum because mm -hmm. uh, they didn't want to upset her. Absolutely. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's really good. So, so your message is what, Karina? What do you really want to get out there? What I would like really to say is it's not acceptable. Domestic abuse on any level is not acceptable. I think we've come a long way from the battered wife syndrome um, and families having to stay together because it was, they felt it was right when in actual fact it's a myth. You know, in order to save your family, move on and, and let your children and yourself yeah. have a good quality life. There are, there's help out there. So how do people get in touch with you then? Um, we can be accessed, we have websites, we have phone numbers. Um, Yep, so 01738 892516. Um, the police domestic abuse officer, who's 01738 892910. And we are very approachable. You don't have to report crime. Um, and there are services out there, not just Bernardo's and the police. You know, we, we work with many, many agencies. Um, and you can get support, and you're not pressured into leaving. I think that's one of the, yeah. the worries. And we know that domestic abuse does affect how you parent your children and that doesn't make you a bad person it just means you need a little bit of help yeah and it is a fact of life and it's one that that is help out there. yes so thank you so much for coming in and talking to us about this very serious subject so if you are a victim of domestic abuse or know someone that is then the message is to seek help to tell someone because there's lots of support out there <laughs>I'm delighted today to be joined by Stephen Lecky. Stephen is Chief Executive of Creef Hydro here in Perthshire. Stephen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Stephen, the family name has been synonymous with Creef Hydro for a number of years now. Can you give a little background to, to the family um, involvement in the business and specifically your own involvement yes. as well more recently? Back in the 1860s, my great-great-grand-uncle, a doctor from Aberdeen, settled upon Creef to build the first maiden hydropathic in Scotland based around the Greek word water. We still have our own water supply today. Mm -hmm. Two artesian wells, we draw water that one gallon a second every second in life. And he settled on Creef for the climate, for the scenery and for the water. And still today, that all that exists as great synonymous spelling and selling points for Creef Hydro. And where the Lecky family fitted in after the war, my father and grandfather reopened the hotel after the war. It was inhabited by Polish sol soldiers. Mm -hmm. Officers had the hotel rooms and the soldiers had the public rooms and still today we find 303 bullets pushed in through the lath and plaster and refurb so we empty the the, um, the combustion part of it out and put them back up and display and today then so I came back to the company in 1994 mm -hmm. um, as a young 28 year old having been a general manager in Queen's Motors as a hotel group down south worked in England for seven or eight years before coming back to Scotland to the family business mm -hmm. and, um, and realized no bar Reputation, reputation for full of old folk, run by the Church of Scotland, and um, and needed money spent on it. We had a million pounds in the bank then. We spent forty million pounds over the past eighteen years. Borrowed ten of it, but put a big bar in a brasserie, French word for bar, and um, and moved forward. We had one hundred and forty staff then. Now we have nearly six hundred staff in the payroll. So it's changed and evolved hugely mm -hmm. over the eighteen years I've been involved. Anyway, yeah, and um, and forty million pounds of investment. And so, I mean, that, that investment, there's been huge renovations on the estate generally, not just in the core hotel over the past few years. What, what, what kind of things have you done to make, because it has moved very much into, a, into a, a family resort, hasn't it? Yes. Well, a family resort, 900 acres, we thought for 100 years that we had 700 acres, we counted it, 800 acres, mm -hmm. we checked it on computer, 907 acres, <laughs> amazing how far you can be at. Yeah. And so the big bar was the big thing, the big conference room. 70% of our trade is leisure business and 30% of our trade comes from uh, corporate, commercial, mm -hmm. business, business tourism. Mm -hmm. And so putting a bar in was a big thing for us. The big country, the children's club, the largest child care practitioner centre in Britain. Mm -hmm. We look after 140 children under the age of 12 in a registered, safe environment. That's a big thing for us as well. Mm -hmm. And the rooms refurbishment, we continue to spend a million pounds a year on rooms refurbishment the proposition to our guest being this is a safe environment for you, your work, work colleagues and your family to come and stay with us and secondly you won't stay in a room more than eight or nine years old, public room, self-catering or hotel bedroom. 
And so we bought the Murray Park Hotel just down the road, 21 mm -hmm. bedrooms, a great wee place, uh, 21 bedrooms, and, um, and we've developed self-catering, spent £12 million on 55, principally five-star self-catering lodges and cottages around the estate, just to try and sweat the assets, try and make maximum mm -hmm. use out of the estate. Mm -hmm. Self-catering works well for us. It's very popular with families in a, an open environment, open plan, kitchen, lounge, diner, all being in the same place. So mum, dad, dad can be watching TV, children playing in the same place as mum's cooking supper, and therefore a great family experience, and that works for us. And then the 60 activities, and we try and do different things. So segways, for example, that's new, unusual segways. Most folk in Scotland don't. We have 21 segways. We don't have 21 segways because we like buying segways. It's because people want to rent them off us. Right. And the same with quad bikes. We have 45 quad bikes. And Laser Quest, we have 47 guns on Laser Quest, and the range of these guns is 800 meters. It's incredible. Mm -hmm. and it's not a cheap thing to do, but it's a great thing to do for our family. So it gives them the chance, instead of sitting in front of the TV all day, playing PlayStation and so on, it gives them a chance to go outside, do something traditional, something fun, as a family, as a unit, work colleagues as well, and then come back in and talk about it in the evening. And, and it's a fantastic conference centre as well. I know I was at the, the um, Chamber of Commerce Star yes, Awards last yes, year. Yes. Fantastic, big, fantastic big room yes. for, a, for an event like that well, as well. The old sports hall, now called the Melville Hall, and within 12 hours we can convert it from a sports hall, badminton courts, four badminton courts, one tennis court, to a massive conference facility which is air-conditioned and lit properly, and what a difference that makes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and therefore allows us to attract big events such as the Star Chamber of Commerce Awards. So, um, plans moving forward? What, what are the aspirations if you were looking, say, maybe to take to move the, the, the Creef Hydro forward over the next 10 to 15 years? Yes, well, my view on this is I'm just a trustee passing through the generations of, I hope, luckies to run the company. And aspirationally, I'm 46 years old, which sucks, I want to be 30 all my life, but that's not going to work, <laughs> is it? I have four children, we have four children, my wife and I, two boys, two girls. I don't know which one of them might be interested. At the moment, two of them are, the two boys are interested in coming back mm -hmm. to follow in their father's footsteps and generations before that. But of course, they have to come back having earned the T-shirt and can wear the T-shirt properly, they wear the mm -hmm. spurs to learn the trade, whatever trade it is at the time. And so the future for us, I think, is about planning for mission for for a site that we have identified on for more self-catering units, a care home, assisted living, more retail, more leisure. And when we go back to self-catering, this isn't about building another 200 self-catering units, this is about doing something different. So glamping, tree houses, wooden houses, log houses, fancy ways, different ways, unusual ways to, to settle on a family a short mm -hmm. break. And I mean, talking about the tree houses and things like that, I, um, you were involved recently in, in a, a five resort initiative around um, green tourism, yes. and I think Creef Hydro was, was quite involved yes. in that. Yes. Can you give some background to, to some of the green initiatives? Well, I think the green tourism initiative scheme is very good, and Visit Scotland run that very well, and we're aiming for a gold standard on that, which is great, and that's appealing to families and businesses. Mm -hmm. We know businesses book large events with us because they like the green aspect. Mm -hmm. Um, so they find it attractive, and frankly, if it can save money and be um, be good in that way economically, then then we're very happy to go down the green tourism route. Great, and um, Creef Creef is a as a resort from from a tourism perspective. You know, we've had a, quite a harsh economic climate over the over the past few years. How how, how is Creef doing? Well, what's good about Creef is its location. Mm -hmm. It's 50 miles from Glasgow, 50 miles from Edinburgh, and an hour and a half from Aberdeen. It's just a great place to visit. It's an easy place to visit. It's a nice drive through the countryside to get to the Creef. So that suits families because Dad can shoot back to the office, which often happens. Mm -hmm. Dad shoots back to the office and families stay and have a great day around the resort doing, participating in these 60-odd activities around and about the state. And Creef Town Centre itself as well, of course, is so important that Creef Town Centre looks good because mm -hmm. all our customers and we can look after up to a thousand customers a day with nearly 600 staff. A thousand customers a day and they don't all spend all day and all night on the Hydro Resort. They want to go down into Creef and just mm -hmm. smell and see and sense what's going on in the local area with wonderful views of Strathern and the valley and just soaking up the atmosphere. In the, in the, main, in the main streets, I was, I was just there about two weeks ago, the main streets quite, um, it's not quite a hive of activity, yes. and busy with shops, yes. and not too many empty yes. units. I, don't, I couldn't see either, yes. which is great. Yes, and it's so important that we keep Creef looking good for mm -hmm. the area, for the county. Stephen, thank you very much indeed for your time thank today. You. Please thank pop you. back in again sometime soon. Thank you.
Well, thanks for tuning in again uh, this week. And remember, we always want to hear from you. You can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, or email us at info at persianonline.co.uk. This is a Persia Internet TV channel. It's not just about you telling us telling us about your news and events for us to for us to um, uh, to, to show, but we're also looking for your pictures. If you're out and about events or something you think is important, send a picture in to us. Or if you've actually got some flip camera footage or something of something you thought was funny or you thought was maybe interesting to the Persia public, then please um, email it in to us. Give us a call. You, 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 you always know where to find us. And it's results next week, isn't it? We're not talking The Voice or X Factor. <laughs> no. Waistline Online next week. The results. <laughs> I'll see you next week.